Welcome back to Night School, uh, episode 11, part uh, Song of Myself, part 9. I'm going to get through that without stumbling one of these times here. And uh, now it is actually evening time, uh, the same day as our last recording, episode uh, 8, or excuse me, episode 10, part 8. There it is. And back with me is my esteemed <laughs> colleague, Mr. Wesley Shantz. Welcome back, Mr. Wesley Shantz. I, I feel like it's been ages, uh, but we did <laughs> want to try to get, we did want to try to get to the middle of this, of this long project. Um, and I think, I think we could just do it here in this next uh, half hour or so of this episode. Um, so we're at 25. Yeah. I'm 52. <laughs> All right. Here it goes. Dazzling and tremendous how quick the sunrise would kill me if I could not now and always send sunrise out of me. We also ascend dazzling and tremendous as the sun. We found our own, oh my soul, in the calm and cool of the daybreak. My voice goes after what my eyes cannot reach. With the twirl of my tongue, I encompass worlds and volumes of worlds. Speech is the twin of my vision. It is unequal to measure itself. It provokes me forever. It says sarcastically, Walt, you contain enough. Why don't you let it out then? Come now, I will not be tantalized. You conceive too much of articulation. Do you not know, O oh speech, how the buds beneath you are folded, waiting in gloom, protected by frost, the dirt receding before my prophetical screams, I underlying causes to balance them at last. My knowledge, my live parts, it keeping tally with the meaning of all things, happiness, which whoever hears me, let him or her set out in search of this day. My final merit, I refuse you. I refuse putting from me what I really am. Encompass worlds, but never try to encompass me. I crowd your sleekest and best by simply looking toward you. Writing and talk do not prove me. I carry the plenum of proof and everything else in my face. With the hush of my lips, I wholly confound the skeptic. All right. Well, I think the essence of that part really does come in the final three lines. And, and him talking about sort of the ineffable spirit that cannot be compassed, that cannot be encompassed. Think of the image of a compass, that which is used to encircle uh, something so, and, or in order to orient you. But this is that which lies outside even that ability. This is like what night is to Zeus. If Zeus is the god that um, embodies order of a society. This is the sort of chaos or, or god or capacity for acts of god that exist outside of order. I carry the plenum of proof and proof and everything, excuse me, and everything else in my face, with the hush of my lips, I confound the skeptic, that there's just something always beyond the rational intellect um, <clears throat> that requires awareness. And um, I think that goes nicely with earlier when he says, dazzling and tremendous, how quick the sunrise would kill me if I could not now and always send the sunrise out of me. And so, um, you have that sunrise sort of coming to consciousness imagery, but the idea of an awakening or coming to consciousness being so costly, so Promethean, so Luciferian that it, it could cause death. But then reversing that and suggesting that sunrise would be a function of what he is. And so it, it's like you are a mortal who is incapable of, or if you come too close to the fire, you will be burned in sort of a faith on son of Apollo way. Uh, or like that old um, Jung often quoted uh, some apocryphal gospel where he said, he who is close to me is close to the fire is the saying of Jesus. Maybe gospel of Thomas, something like that. It's not one of the um, canon ones. And so, but then he takes on again this divine role of like sending the sunrise out of me. But that could also be an existential role because of his subjective experience, he can see a sunrise and without him being there, there would not be a sunrise to be perceived at all at that level of analysis. It is simply because we are the sort of creature 
that we are and that sunrise is in some way something that we can perceive within our very limited range of vision and, and is some way functionally useful to us that 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 which is called sunrise exists. Well, yeah, just get philosophical. Okay. And then again, he goes, I think he engages with the poetic tradition. Is he ready? My voice goes after what my eyes cannot reach. He's, he's, he like Dante is attempting to express the ineffable. With the twirl of my tongue, I encompass worlds and volumes of worlds. He can express so much, but he still can't express himself. And then he names himself again and then italics in this edition. Walt, you contain enough. Why don't you let it out then? That's, that's him asking himself, is he, is he ready to represent what is with speech its twin, the twin of his vision? And, well, the fact that we're reading this seems to be that the answer is yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I, yeah, I think that's, that's a really interesting dialogue there and the twinning of speech and vision, and then how speech turns in on, on him and says sarcastically to him, yeah. Um, and I wonder about um, what the equivalent of that would be for vision. Wouldn't it be like being perceived by the sunrise or something like that? And that's sort of where the, the part 25 starts with like the sunrise would kill me. Like it's, it's so powerful, it's so overwhelming. Um, and and his answer to speech is really interesting too, right? Um, how don't you know how the buds beneath you are folded? Um, that that image of the bud that's waiting in gloom, protected by frost, um, and how his his screams, his prophetical screams, push away the dirt. In some sense, it's this part is like very garbled to me as far as like syntactically what's going on. Um, it's like he's eliding some commas that should be there to help with apposition. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he does that too with direct speech, right? He doesn't have a comma after Walt. So there's a kind of like, and when he addresses O speech directly, he doesn't, he doesn't put in those commas. I think the effect then is to sort of like slow you down. At least for me, when I was trying to read it, it definitely slowed me down. And I was like, wait, like, what is he doing to, to the dirt here? And the image that I, I kind of come away with is his, the heat of his breath is like um, warming the frosty dust and pushing the dirt aside for those, um, those underlying causes, those buds to be able to come up. Um, and, and it's interesting how he says, like, if, you, he, if you're hearing me, at all, then what you're going to do right now is go search for happiness, right? Like, again, this, this thing, this distinction between like words as something you just read in a book versus words which like call you, invoke something in you and call you forth to, um, to action, to, to adventure. It's, that's the thing he's really after here, right? Um, that's, I think, really, really stirring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on to 26 then. Right on. All right. Now I will do nothing but listen to accrue what I hear into this song, to let sounds contribute toward it. I hear bravuras of birds, bustle of growing wheat. Gossip of flames, clack of sticks, cooking my meals. I hear the sound I love, the sound of the human voice. I hear all sounds running together, combined, fused or following. Sounds of the city and sounds out of the city. Sounds of the day and night, talking of young ones to those that like them. The loud laugh of work people at their meals. The angry bass of disjointed friendship, the faint tones of the sick. The judge with hands tight to the desk, his pallid lips, pronouncing the death sentence. The heave e yo of Steve Doors, unlading, unlading, ships by the wharves, the refrain of the anchor lifters. The ring of alarm bells, the cry of fire, the whir of swift streaking engines and hose carts with premonitory tinkles and colored lights. The steam whistle, the solid roll of the train of approaching cars. The slow march played at the head of the association marching two and two, 
they go to guard some corpse. The flag tops are draped with black muslin. I hear a violoncello. Tis the young man's heart's complaint. I hear the keyed cornet. It glides quickly in through my ears. It shakes mad sweet pains through my belly and breast. I hear the chorus. It is a grand opera. Ah, this indeed is music. This suits me. A tenor large and fresh as the creation fills me. The orbic flex of his mouth is pouring and filling me full. I hear the trained soprano. What work with hers is this? The orchestra whirls me wider than Uranus flies. It wrenches such ardors from me, I did not know I possessed them. It sails me, I dab with bare feet. They are licked by the indolent waves. I am cut by bitter and angry hail. I lose my breath, steeped amid honeyed morphine, my windpipe throttled in fakes of death. At length, let up again to feel the puzzle of puzzles. And that we call being. <laughs> That's awesome. The the uh, the word that every student, if you do read this poem with your class, the word that every kid is going to love right there, if you read it soon, before there's some new fashion, is dab. They, they're they going to love that when they come to that part, right? Okay, so part 26, he does nothing but listen, but of course he does do something other than listen. He, he conveys, he expresses uh, and mimes and and provides a kind of um, recording for you of all this stuff that he heard. And in this respect, he, this part reminds me a lot of, of sort of experimental music. Like um, I think John Cage has some things like this and other people like um, Studs Terkel, the oral historian, has some things where he'll just kind of record the ambient sounds. Um, and I know there's others, there's probably better examples, but those are the ones that come to mind. And of course, Whitman does it in, inimitably here uh, with his own language, right? To kind of convey all of these sounds, things that are natural, things that are created by humans, the human voice, right? The sound he loves. And in some sense, he kind of hears that in everything, I want to say, um, because everything is fodder for his human voice, which he loves. Um, and the voice of the person reading the poem, which he loves in expectation. Uh, and I think he does, he does privilege works of human craft and, um, and things that relate to people, which makes sense. Um, because of course, what he's interested in, right, is the puzzle of puzzles and that we call being. And you can read that either as two separate things or the name for the puzzle of puzzles is what we call being, something like that, right? It's kind of like a, uh, a, uh, a, a point of uh, quibbling in a way, right? Semantics maybe, but but I think it would be interesting to try to tease apart what role all this music of life plays into the puzzle of puzzles and that we call being, right? The, the word call, again, is right there. Um, in some sense, if we can name it, it's not quite the thing anymore. It's just the, the closest that we can get. It's the best we can do it's the constant like struggle of of like the mystic appropriation um, apprehension of reality versus the attempt to actually express that and and convey it to someone else. It's I, I mean this makes sense as the sort of the heart, the midpoint numerically at least of the poem. Although I think we might be less than halfway as far as like actual line length. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, and I wonder to what extent, looking at all that, all the music uh, imagery, the violin, cello, the keyed cornet, the mad sweet pangs, the chorus, music, the Susan, tenor large, orbit flex of mouth, trained soprano, orchestra, uh, you, you know, uh, they're, they're all there. Um, to what extent that's supposed to suggest to us that what the puzzle of puzzles is, is the sort of creative act of man and trying to go from the creative act to the man himself in order to understand sort of the harmony of his being. 
suggesting that sort of the highest manifestation of one's being is the creation, is the conscious creation of uh, a puzzle that can be solved by, me, by means of sort of intuition and skill. Um, sort of like how when you, you set out to play a piece of music, you have, a pe you, you have faith that it will make sense and be pleasant to the ears and that, um, that that is what he wishes your experience to be as you read this poem too, that you not only enjoy the sound of it, like the sound of an opera, but that you also start to get the story of it, like in an opera as well, or like in a symphony, that it, it, it takes you to a certain place and it starts to reveal to you its form over time. And in fact, its form is not random, as you may have thought at first, but uh, a pattern emerges. And a, a grand pattern, if it is a grand work, a grand opera itself. Um, oh. That's that's a that's a point that I keep coming back to with Whitman actually in this poem and I think in his work as a whole is since he isn't obeying isn't following isn't writing within established modes what is he doing right he's creating his own form he's um, inviting us to find certain patterns he's playing with our expectations and and he defies us to say that anything in here is totally random I think that's certainly true but maybe the puzzle of puzzles is like why does he put this word next you know why does he have this stanza be the number of lines that it is and this line be the number of syllables that it is it's like he's following a, a kind of organic development which mm -hmm. he's challenging us to understand and and like and figure out right like to to um to exhaust its possibilities seems to be his his goal here. Um, to to yeah again I, I go back to that word like defy us to to comprehend his his creative um, process. And it's a great it's a great challenge to to think if you like stopped reading and covered up the next line, could you figure out? Would you be even close to whatever the next thing he's going to name, right? From the angry base of disjointed friendship, the faint tones of the sick, what's going to come next? Oh, of course, the judge with hands tight to the desk, right? So <laughs> it's fantastic. And it would be a great game, I think, to, um, to imitate this, like as a writing assignment, to give kids like a section of the poem and say, write your own version of this. Like you... You can borrow some of his language, but you've got to you've got to go off on a tangent of your own and try to do something that you think like fits with what he's doing here and and answers it and like stands up to um, to his kind of his creative uh, mark. It's it's an awesome challenge for future poets. That would be that would be a really fun um, assignment to do and to uh, uh, to administer to excuse me, to uh, pass out. So, well, dare we try the Magnificent 27? <laughs> yeah, here we go. Okay, uh, 27. To be in any form, what is that? Round and round we go, all of us, and ever come back thither. If nothing lay more developed, the quahog in its callous shell were enough. Mine is no callous shell. I have instant conductors all over me, whether I pass or stop. They seize every object and lead it harmlessly through me. I merely stir, press, feel with my fingers, and am happy. To touch my person to someone else's is about as much as I can stand. All right, well, I, very interesting here. Um, the callous shell I take to be sort of like a um, spiral shell. Um, and mine is no callous shell. I have instant conductors all over me, whether I pass or stop. He, uh, he's, he's very interesting because, uh, so he ends the, the part before 26 with being, and then to be in any form, what is that? Recalls to me the notion that you brought up this morning about being embodied and that He's here saying, what would it mean to be in a different form? Well, we have no idea because this is how we are. Like I stir, I press, I feel with my fingers and 
happy. And if I'm judging someone else, it's as happy as I can be. To some extent, um, the deepest, hardest questions of philosophy are far less important than the most common experiences that we might have during a day or, or ones that might even seem common but are actually apex experiences, like touching another human in an affectionate way, generally something people like. Um, round and round we go. Remind, get, uh, remind, recalls to me the image of Uranus and also the symphony, sort of the uh, not only the movement of the heavens in an orderly fashion, but also sort of the Nietzschean idea of the eternal return and also sort of the Hindu idea of the ever come back thither. Um, like it's as if we're repeating the same story over and over again. And I suppose to some extent that is literally true of every generation of man insofar as People try and walk the path of the hero. A lot of people don't or fail, and things get better or worse along sort of those lines. Who, how many people of character emerge and produce something of worth for their people, and how many don't? Uh, but mine is no callous shell. What, what do you do with this one, Wes? I feel like I'm pondering around, but that, uh, even though it's so short, I can't. Maybe, maybe it lacks form. And uh, I, I just can't, it's too protean for me. Yeah, well, I think you've done a great job. Like, I'm glad you came back to Uranus because he seems, in that planet, that, that um, mythological figure seems really important, right? As the kind of, the, he wields the sickle, right? Um, yes. If I got that right, he's the one yes. with the sickle? Okay, and, uh, and chops up his father. Or, or, or sorry, 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 sorry. It's Kronos that gets Uranus with the sickle. Sorry. There we go. Right on. Okay. So it's like this process of um, of analyzing is a violent process, but it's a way of breaking things down. Like he's he doesn't just like shout, you know, he does he does articulate and he doesn't just have one long line, although some of the lines are really long. He <laughs> does break them into length that are manageable for the human breath uh and and he's he's breaking it into stanzas and into parts and and so there's there's definitely some order here and it's it's very interesting that he says his is not a quahog shell right it's it's not that hard he he's saying it's porous it it has senses it um it intermingles with the surroundings and so it we don't want to make it too Im, impenetrable right um but on the other hand, yeah, maybe protean is a good word for it because it's because it's so open to interpretation. And I think I would challenge him here in in his claim that he merely stirs, presses, feels, he seizes objects and leads them harmlessly through him. Well, I guess in a sense that's true, right? In a in an ultimate sense, maybe you aren't harmed, right? Maybe things do work out for the best. But I think in an immediate sense you have to say that certain experiences are going to harm you, right? And you'd rather not have them. <laughs> you certainly act as if that were true. And so I would, I would press him a little bit on this. I'd press him back, right? Maybe he wants that and say, well, look, you don't simply let things pass through you. Like there are things that, that do you damage and things that you in accessing will do damage to, you know, potentially at least. And like, maybe that, that is a, maybe that's a, a bit of a, a failing of this poem. It, perhaps it's too all-embracing. It's too um, loosey-goosey at times and not not firm enough, not taking a firm enough stand against certain things that might be bad and for certain things that might be good. But, but his intentions do seem to be quite a bit uh, outside of those normal categories. And so I think that's kind of what's going on in this, this, real, this short one here, but it's a kind of um, yeah, kind of a corollary to that, that long one that we just read. You know, that's interesting because uh, it does make me think that his morality would fall along the dimension of liberality in terms of wanting maximal freedom. And, uh, and so, so that he, that would lead him less to care about whether what somebody was doing was good or bad and more uh, think along the domain of free or unfree to do it, 
to do so. And that in, in not passing judgment on some things, he's actually, he's actually missing something or not, not giving something that would uh, not take away from the poem, but add character to it. Um, I think that's interesting that he, that he might be coming off as too permissive um, and that that's, that's not a virtue at a certain extent, to a certain extent. Um, especially if you ever listen to one of those Peterson lectures on the 19th century Victorians and um, <laughs> just how restricted they were because of how awful and prevalent and, and uh, you know, really demonically seeming syphilis was. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. And uh, so, you know, it was no joke, apparently, and um, really did seem like sort of uh, a curse from God uh, in how it manifested in sort of a, a ton of ways, um, mm -hmm. very different ways. And so it was very odd. And so, so you know, permissiveness to some extent um, can be bounded by disease. And, well, you know, yeah. I, yeah. I think, I think the... Um... I think this goes back to his his masculine feminine thing as well that he's been playing with in the poem because um if you if you are thinking about like the the touch of another person there's there's a romantic and a sexual aspect to that but there's also the nurturing aspect to that and yeah. I think it's it's sort of it's an ambivalent image because you can sort of read it either way if you read it in the, the sort of sense of like the mother that he's been talking about as like the greatest the thing than which nothing is greater, right? Like as a mother. Well, then it is that important, right? Like to, to touch and, and show love uh, to your infant child is like the most important thing you can do, right? To, to ever give that kid like a stable um, psychological footing uh, in their future life it, it seems to be... Um, the indications of of all the research that we have so so i think you know on that side yeah by all means this is this is the this is the best thing there is on the other hand right there's the potential for devastating harm if you don't get enough of that that human contact or if you get the wrong in contact right that's that's going to be i think we can fairly say bad for for everyone <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, it's funny. It just makes me think of, um, and I can't wait till we do British literature at some point. Uh, probably this won't be a part of it, but it makes me think of the difference between, like, say, Harry Potter and Lord Voldemort. Um, both of them sort of neglected young men who end up being sort of rapscallions because of it. And, um, and they sort of, uh, well, you know, like you were saying, the research indicates, or at least so we, we've heard, from old Dr. Peterson, if, if you're not socialized at all between two and four, you're gonna have a pretty rough life. And so, you know, you gotta be touched. And we, we are social creatures and we, we have to, you know, share substantial bread with each other. We, we share information with each other, but touch is also a way of conveying information. You know, we shake hands, we do those, we hug each other, we kiss each other on the cheek, we uh, we do that little half hug and uh, <laughs> and handshake. We do uh, fist bumps. You know, there are a lot of ways that we touch each other, and uh, in in you know socially appropriate ways. Um, and you know that's because we're embodied beings, and so that is a method of communication for us, an important method of communication. Right? And you're supposed to look into someone's eyes and stand up straight. And all of that is something you do not tell in a disembodied thought. It's something you tell to a creature that, can, that has exercise over choice, but also a specific form that can portray itself better or worse. And I think what you're leading towards is that, well, what we would like from Whitman as, you know, sort of a setter of the character of an American poet to have some backbone and stand for something. Right. Even though that yeah. doesn't encompass everything. Of course, that's right. And that is the sacrifice that you have to make if you're going to stand for something, I think. And I wonder if you agree that you, you can't encompass everything in the same way, but that um, 
I wonder to what extent your perspective shrinks but magnifies what it does see that in making that which it does not yet what in that would then make that which it does not perceive as clearly on the outside i think proportionately unclear to that which you do see on the inside and that i don't know there could be sort of a, an equation of perception so that you could still see things as they actually were i, I just i think of homer and his portrayal of the Trojans and the Greeks, even though he, he does um, uh, overpower the Greeks and um, show favoritism, he does do a good job of humanizing the Trojans as well. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that was too jumbled, <laughs> too protean myself. I, no, I, I follow you. And I think the uh, Achilles shield is another good example of that as well. Um, which, well, you know, I think sort of what Whitman's doing here, maybe you've brought this up before, I can't remember. He's doing something like an extended Achilles shield um, through this whole poem and, you know, creating a new model for what that would even look like for, for his new society. Um, I do, I think I do need to call it a night here at this point, um, but this was, a, this was great. I'm, I'm glad we're making some progress here. Yeah, as am I, as am I. And this is really fun. It was fun doing this twice today. And it's it's funny that this is like us going uh this is like us going fishing together or something like that at this point. Or it's like intramurals. It's like, well, going to go do a podcast now, honey. You know. Right on. Yeah. Well, it's fun to offer this to people and well, we're halfway through. And so if you've gotten this far, you might as well finish. Yeah. I'm I'm uh on board for continuing this project at least through this poem and if we don't get into british stuff anytime soon well you know at some point we will but there's lots more american poets too so yeah um yeah. lots to read lots, lots to talk about yeah, yeah and I, I actually um i i have a couple books novels i'd like to go with you through at some point maybe as like a summer project but i would love to see what we could do with say like moby dick uh that might take a year, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we would have to. I think at least we would have to read beforehand. Let's let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, on that one. And I think that is like a major goal way down the road. Maybe maybe once we uh, start making this more of our full time gig, we can get we can really attack that. But I and I do agree that it should be more poetry for a while. But I don't know. I'm excited to get into the American stuff. It's not something I've taught. And so it's something I've been wanting to teach for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, effectively we're, we're doing more and more all the time. So maybe at some point this will be a self-sustaining project, but um, that depends on the friendly donations of our listeners, I think. Yes, that's right. If you're listening on YouTube, listen tens of thousands of times and share as much as you can and subscribe, please. And if you're on anchor, you can just, Donate to either my channel or Wes's channel, um, Bookworm Games. Um, and um, you can do it on a, a rolling basis for like $1 a month up to, I think, 5 or 10 or a custom amount. But, you know, anything helps. And I can tell you this, the amount of positive emotion that we experience when you ever clap or like or share is way disproportionate to uh, how easy it is for you to do that um we we love it i love it especially as an extrovert um <laughs> wes i'm sure uh, i don't want to speak too much for you but, oh yeah, yeah. i d definitely agree i've seen on facebook i think alex manzoni he's a he's a local poet here in spokane and i've i've met him a few times at different events and stuff and he's very been very kind to to like a number of these episodes so far so if he's if you're listening alex thanks for that um and uh people who like poetry should check out manzoni's podcasts and, and videos and stuff he makes there they are who all right well very cool and uh well until next time mr west's chance all right thanks again